Well, good morning. Welcome to Holy Trinity Church. My name is Christian Park. I'm an elder and the director of Intentional Christian Communities. I'm so thankful to be able to come and worship with all of you. It's such a, a joy to come together at a place like this, in the loop, almost like in the center of the city of Chicago, in this world-class place. But what's even better than that is that I get to come to worship with you. You know, because y'all are just like me, broken. If you think of that, we're, we're broken from the past because of our sin. We're, we're presently broken that in need of daily repentance. You know, if you look around to the people on the left and the right and the front of you and the back of you, None of us here are perfect. And there's a beauty in that. That there's a great comfort in that. Because we come together before a perfect and holy God. And because of him, his perfection rests on us. And that's why I come to worship. And when I think of that, that gets me into a mood to worship. Let me read to you from Psalm 1830, it says this. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. So church, let's all rise together and sing. Amen. If you're having trouble finding a seat, there are some seats up front. Um, and yeah, let's let's stand and sing worthy of every song we could ever sing. One, two. song we could ever sing worthy of every praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Good morning, everybody. <laughs> yeah, my name is Jesse uh, Salinas, and it is a joy to worship with you today. And so we're going to continue our worship by stating the words of the Apostles' Creed. So if this is your first time or your manyth tough times to use these words to say them as we worship together, I want to challenge you to really reflect and meditate on who we are about to proclaim the triune God to be. So Christian... What do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, so now I think next week there might be a four-day weekend for many people in the room. So I want you to share with your neighbor, meet somebody new, what are you doing next weekend? And if you have no plans, make some plans together, all right? <laughs>
All right, at this time you can begin to find your seats. As you uh, begin to sit down, if, uh, if there's a couple of seats in between you and your neighbor, if you wouldn't mind scooting towards the center of your rows uh, to make room for others, we would appreciate it this morning. We, uh, we ordered some extra chairs that are on their way. It was supposed to be ordered, come on Friday, but they're not coming until Monday, so next week we'll have some more chairs for everybody. But if you wouldn't mind scooting into the center, that would help us out today. Well, uh, good morning again. Glad to be with you today. I have a couple of announcements for us. Uh, to begin with, if you are new or visiting with us, we would love it if you would take a few moments at this time to fill out the Get Connected card. It's a part of our bulletin that you can fill out, tear off, and put it in the offering bag in a few moments. Uh, if, you're, if you're using a digital bulletin, you can scan one of the QR codes on the back of these pillars and you can fill it out online as well. It allows us to get to know you, allows us to follow up with you a little bit later on. Also, a couple of little housekeeping things. If you need a Bible today, we're going to be opening up God's Word in a few moments. Uh, we have Bibles at two different tables on both sides of the room. You can go grab one of those. I'll also make a little quick plug for uh, these little scripture journals. They're also on the table for uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, if you haven't picked up one of these and you would like one, please do grab it. Uh, it's yours for the taking. Uh, you can use it to take notes as we've been studying uh, the book of 1 Corinthians together. Well, just a couple of things to note for our calendar. Uh, for starters, during the summer, oh, we try to create some opportunities for our men's and, and women's ministries to gather together. And so if you're uh, looking to get plugged in, getting to hang out with some folks, the, the women are doing a Bible study in the book of Amos. So if you're interested in that, you can, if you can uh, reach out to someone at the welcome table or email us. Uh, men, we're doing some prayer times and some barbecues. Uh, so do look for the details in the bulletin about that. Uh, but all together as a church, we like to find time to hang out during the summer. And so this coming uh, Wednesday is going to be our first congregational all-church picnic uh, for the summer. We're going to be doing one in June, July, and August. Uh, so if you are free Wednesday night, come join us over at Humboldt Park. Uh, we'll be there right near the boathouse. Uh, bring bring a, a meal, bring something to share with others, but we're just going to have a picnic together and enjoy uh, this, the Chicago summer together. So if you've got friends or neighbors who would like to, to join us as well, they're, they're more than welcome. Uh, those are kind of the main things that I wanted to highlight is that we really emphasize community and fellowship during the summer. So please do take time to, to plug in uh, to an opportunity. If you are interested in any of those things or have questions, we've got people back at our welcome table right after the service. They'd love to talk to you and answer your questions and, and introduce themselves to you. Uh, but those are the announcements. At this time, we're going to continue in our worship service. We're going to have a couple of uh, uh, dedications. And so John, uh, Pastor John's going to come forward and lead us in that. Or he will in a moment as he's coming from the back. <laughs> My wife asked for a glass of water, so that was the priority for a moment. Uh, will the parents of Finn, Chandler, Pulley, and Hannah, Elizabeth, Yehen Ku, please bring them forward for dedication to the Lord at this time. You guys can just stand right down here, okay? Bring the whole crew. So um, I'll just say this as we begin. Just want to tell you, Jason and Jasmine and Jana and Nathan, that I'm thankful for your lives. So Jason has been serving as our uh, director of finance over the last two and a half years and wears about seven different hats um, and is working really hard raising his family with Jasmine, thankful for both you guys. Jasmine is a photographer. Um, go, go to her Instagram account and you'll be able to see her. All right, all right. And Jan and Nathan um, have been deacons at Holy Trinity over the last number of years. And I'm mentioning that because raising children is an act of faith. And in particular, I'd say raising children in a city is an act of faith. So. Amy and I are grateful to have raised our five children in the city, uh, but we're, we're thankful for missionaries and partners in the gospel who are also raising their kids in the city. Um, dedication is what's about to happen, 
And dedication is not something that's commanded in the scriptures. But uh, Hannah, who uh, in the book of 1 Samuel was weeping and praying before the Lord and asking God to give her a child, to give her a son. And when God gave her her son Samuel, she, it says that she exalted the Lord for what he had done. But it also says that she brought her son Samuel to the Lord to tell the, the Lord that this child belongs first to him, first to the father, and then secondly to her. And so in, in imitation, in one sense, of that instinct of Hannah, um, both the pulleys and the coos are bringing their kids this morning to dedicate them to the Lord. And I'm just going to say a, a word from the Old and the New Testament, if I can. In the Old Testament, what it talks about, um, Jason and Jasmine and Nathan and Jana, is filling your home with the Word of God and with the love of God. That, so that there's an environment in the home that the kids can almost tangibly feel that God is present. This is what Moses is told by God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. In other words, your family is almost a kind of portable classroom. Not so that you're talking about Jesus every single moment, but that you're looking for those teachable moments to help them see who God is and what he's done for them. And then in the book of Ephesians, so you got the Old Testament and the New Testament, elevating the calling of parents. And in the New Testament, Paul writes and he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And then he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And what I'm going to do now is I am going to introduce the children to you at this time. So I'm going to take Finn first. Thank you. 
great job, Hannah. All right, I'm just going to ask uh, Jason and Jasmine and Nathan and Jana for you guys to make some promises. Do you acknowledge Finn and Hannah's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? And do you claim God's covenant promises on his behalf and her behalf and look in faith to the Lord Jesus for their salvation as you do for your own? And do you now unreservedly dedicate Finn and Hannah to God and promise that you will set before them a godly example to teach them the truths of who Jesus is and the possibility of eternal life to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? If so, please say we do. All right, I'm going to ask everybody else to stand up, and uh, I'm just going to ask you to, um, insofar as you're able, to come alongside them. So do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting these parents in their Christian nurture of their children? If so, please say we do. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, you guys, can you stay up here one more minute? There's a gift from the children of Holy Trinity that Lyra and Maxine, I think the Lake girls have, that they're going to bring forward at this time. So special delivery from Lyra and Maxine. Good job, you guys. Keep coming. And that's a Bible for them to read with their family. Good job, you guys. Will you pray with me? Just pray with, we, with me one moment. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, community and for children. We thank you for giving us uh, family together in this city. And we pray, Lord, for little Finn and Hannah that you would help them to be raised, as, uh, as we said, in your grace and in your light, and uh, as parenting is not always an easy task, we pray for great patience, great wisdom, and that you would uh, continue to pour out your love on Jason and Jasmine and upon Jana and Nathan. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Ted and Elizabeth are going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing your praise to your name, O Most High. Father, we praise your name this morning because you are a God of worthy of praise. Father, you created the universe and your name will ring true through eternity. God, you are just and righteous and you hold all things in your hands even when times of opposition arise. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. God, you are the only source of holiness. You are just and righteous in the true light and in you there is no darkness. Yet, Lord, we fall short. We love the things of this world, and we do not practice righteousness. We have not walked in the way you walk, Jesus. And we pause now to humbly come to your feet, confess, and repent of our sins. For if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Yet if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus, we praise your name above all. You, Jesus, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, having made a way for salvation for us. We praise you, Father, for your divine forbearance and forgiveness. God, you have shown us how to give thanks in all circumstances. So, Lord, we just thank you now today for the freedom of declaring us righteous and hiding us in the work of Christ Jesus. 
We thank you for this community that you brought us into in your work at HDC and our partnership in this gospel. What a blessing it is to serve this world that aches for your healing. Lord, we thank you that on one coming day, tears, shame, injustice, war, death, and sin will be no more. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. God, in this turbulent and broken society, the only thing that we look for is your voice. The only thing that we look for, the only thing that we crave, the only thing that we trust is your voice. God, we celebrate the end of Roe v. Wade and give you thanks for mitigating the end to abortions occurring in this country. Father, but as we celebrate the sanctity of life, we also lament over the women who are currently living in fear. We pray that at this very moment, the greater church of Christ can demonstrate the true message of the gospel, which is one of hope and love. A message that is not only words of comfort and prayer, but a message that is supported by action, that we, the church, use our time and money and effort to care for these women. That God, as you adopted us into your family, that we would also consider adoption of those who cannot be cared for by their mothers and fathers. Father, I also pray that in this divisive time, we would be a church of patience, a church that is slow to anger, quick to listen, and fast to forgive. We'd be a church that is grounded in your word, but understands the complexities of this world and has grace to those who we disagree with. Lord, in this moment, allow us to hear your voice. God, we continue to love the city that we live in, the city that we love. Father, as the summer months come, we know that there's an uptick in violence. Lord, you are the worker of miracles and you have the ability to make this city crime free. You are able to instantly halt all violence and crime, and Lord, we are calling on you to do so now. Father, our faith is small and limited, but yours is eternal and unlimited. Give us your faith to believe, Lord, that you will someday end violence in this city. We also lift up the Ukrainian crisis, Lord, and though we feel powerless, we know that you continue to sit on your throne and hold all things in your hand. We pray that this is an opportunity for your gospel to infiltrate Ukraine and to comfort them with your spirit. We specifically pray for the refugees, the women, and the children who, had to, who have had to flee their country. Provide them shelter and hope in this time. We also pray for Putin, Lord. Would you take his heart of stone and exchange it for a heart of flesh? Lord, we continue to thank you for HCC and how this church has led us through these difficult times. We pray for the leaders, the elders, deacons of this church, and pray that you continue to instill them with your spirit. We pray for the discipleship opportunities over the summer, as well as our many ministry partners abroad, and that you would use these opportunities to allow people to know and love you more. God, your word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In this confusing time, God, we pray that you help us not lean on our own understanding. Father, we pray that your voice is clear and that we are not swayed by the world, but continue to be grounded by your spirit and your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. At this time, uh, the kids are dismissed for Kid City, and uh, the rest of us, let's stand and sing together.
please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Good morning, church. Uh, if everyone could open their Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 13, or their phones. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, welcome again to Holy Trinity. I'm John, one of the pastors, and you've joined us on a Sunday where we are studying, uh, as it says behind me, Church on Fire, the idea that uh, sometimes the church can be on fire, so to speak, in a good way. That is, um, seeing the power of God moving within the congregation, but sometimes it can be on fire in a bad way, that is, picking up some of the cultural burning that's happening in our, our society today, and it comes into the church. Christianity starts with faith and is structured with knowledge, but the ethos of Christianity is to be love. Let me just say that again. Christianity begins with faith. It's built on faith. It's structured with knowledge, but the ethos, the the culture of Christianity is to be one of love. Put it differently. There's that little saying that goes like this. People don't really know, people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? So if you think of it, what, if you were to balance your knowledge, man, there's some smart people in this room. A little later, we're going to line up according to (laughs) people's IQ level. But there's smart people in this room. The question, though, is if you were to take sort of a balance and go put your knowledge on one side and put your love on the other side, which one would outweigh the other one? Um, There's a song that was written a long time ago, before I was born, okay? uh, 1960, goes like this. I don't know much about history. You probably heard it before by Sam Cooke, who some people call the uh, father of gospel music, but I don't know much about history. I don't know much about biology. I don't know much about a science book. I don't know much about the French I took. But I do know that I love you and that if you love me too, what a wonderful world it would be. Some of you know that song, right? (laughs) What a wonderful world it would be. In other words, he's saying the same kind of theme. Like, yeah, biology was important in high school. And for some of you medical professionals, it's definitely still important. But what drives our knowledge? Is it love or is it something else? Or if you think the title of that song is, What a Wonderful World, right? 
but how wonderful does our world seem to be? How loving is our world right now? Isn't it true that we need a, an outpouring of love in the city of Chicago? An outpouring of love to ourselves that spills over to our neighbors to let them know that we love them. You know, as you get older, there's kind of two tendencies. One is to get crustier and angrier and more bitter and uh, harder. Your heart to get harder. And the other one is that your heart gets softer to God, to other people. Man, that's hard to do. But which one is happening to you? The University of Chicago on the south side has uh, this motto that says, in, in Latin, it says, uh, crescat sentia vita escolator. And basically what it means is one way to think of it is, uh, when knowledge increases, life enriches. When knowledge increases, life enriches. But what happens a lot of times is that as knowledge increases, ego increases. Pride increases. So Paul says here, he says, knowledge is just puffing you up. You see people who know so much, and because they know so much, it's like you just want to pop them sometimes. Like, watch their ego go. I said that as if it's other people, but the more you know, the more you need God to work on your heart. Here's a question I want to put before you this morning is, as your knowledge increases, is your love increasing? As your knowledge increases, as you get more degrees, as you learn more verses of the Bible, as you listen to more podcasts, is your love increasing? And the Apostle Paul puts this before the Corinthian church because they loved knowledge. They loved philosophy, science. They're at one of these urban crossroads where philosophy and religion was all mixed up. And they were so interested in what the latest philosophical teaching was that they were just following people around like, I'm with this guy, I'm with this guy. They were in the first century doing that follow thing. Some were saying, I'm a, a Paul, I'm of I'm a Cephas, I'm of Apollos. And you know that little statement in 1 Corinthians 13? You know, there's these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is what? Love, right? This is the one that's going to last, is love. But it seems like North American Christianity could use an injection of that today. The more you follow Jesus, the more your ego should shrink. Because he's the one who is supreme over all. And the more you follow Jesus, the more you see how great his love is. I'm just going to divide this text into three sections. I know it's a little confusing when we first start listening to it about food offered to idols and all that. But let me give it three sections. Number one, verses one to three, I'll just call it what God values. There's something that God values here in the text. The second little section, verses four to six, is who God is. So it moves from what God values to who he is and some of what his character is. And then basically verses 7 to 13 is kind of what does that mean for us, right? So what God values, who God is, and then what it means for us. And um, my, my title for today is Puffed Up or Built Up? Are you puffed up or are you building up? And my claim is that Christianity starts with faith. It's informed by knowledge but it needs to be marked by love. So we bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the chance to, to be in Chicago in the summertime, for um, the sun coming through the windows. We thank you that last night you kept us alive and gave us breath this morning. We thank you that we can sing to you. We thank you for grace that Jesus has given us uh, a new song. Put a new song in our heart. We thank you for little Hannah and little Finn today and the promise of new life. And we ask that you bless us today in the name of Jesus. Amen.
So verses 1 to 3, if you were to ask, someone were to ask you, what does God value, what would you say? In this context, it's pretty clear that what he values is not so much knowledge, but more love. Which is not to say that he doesn't value knowledge. In fact, God wants us to know his word and read his word and understand his word. And all of you who are pursuing advanced degrees, he's not down on that. But the question is, to what degree is your love also increasing? Paul's writing, uh, as I mentioned, to this group in the first century in the epicenter of Corinth. And they've been corresponding with him. If you look at how it says in verse 8, now concerning food offered to idols, we want you to know that quote unquote. He's quoting them. So they wrote a letter to him. And you can see this at chapter 7, verse 1 also. They wrote him a letter about sexual immorality, and he's getting back to them. So you know how it is sometimes that somebody writes to you and they, like, they have their list of things that they've said to you. He's getting back to them on their list. And one of the things on their list was this idea of food offered to idols. And this little point here, he says, all of us possess knowledge, is going to sneak us into the next little section, verses 4 to 6. But basically what they were saying is, hey, if there's only one true God... As we pagans who, have, who, who were polytheists in the first century and believed in many, many gods, and now we've come to believe that there is only one true God, then what's the big deal about going into a, a, a temple that practices idolatry and eating meat offered to idols? Like, we all know there's only one true... He's, he's actually, let me rephrase that. We who have been saved by Christ know that there's really only one true God. So if we go eat food offered to idols, we're just eating meat. And so what, what they said is, hey, we, have, we all possess knowledge. Don't we all know that there's really only one true God? And his response to them is more of a rebuke. It's, yes, you have knowledge, but you're letting that knowledge puff you up. Some people argue that actually the... One of the biggest problems in uh, Corinth is actually pride. Uh, over in chapter uh, 4, he says he doesn't want any of you to be, this is 4 verse 6, I don't want you to be puffed up in favor of one another. Or in verse 18 of chapter 4, he says some of you are arrogant. Chapter 5 verse 2, he says you're arrogant. Chapter 5 or 6, your boasting is not good. I mean, it's got to be a little bit of a problem if somebody six or seven times in a letter, like, by the way, you're arrogant. By the way, you're puffed up. Paul is trying to humble them, but he's also trying to be humble himself. Being knowledgeable about the world doesn't mean being cavalier towards others. Christianity is not merely stuff you know in your brain. It's not merely cognitive. It's also affective. It's also relational. And, and this idea that we are more spirit, somebody's more spiritual because they know more cuts against who Jesus really is. If you think of Jesus, he is a person who's the son of God, knows all things, humbles himself, teaches the way of the kingdom. Incredibly humble. That's what Paul is saying. That's the way of the church. Not to, do you think how puffed up Jesus could be? Paul is saying, no, no, no. Shrink your ego and become somebody that serves other people. Frankly, Christians have not always done a great job of loving our neighbors. Especially today, it seems like Christians are really known not for love, but for divisiveness or judgmentalism or things like that. So what if God would do a new thing in our day and plant the seeds of love, plant the seeds of compassion on others to flow over to our neighbors? I'm talking about something supernatural, not something human, something that he does. Don't get puffed up. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, just as our love for God begins with listening to God's word, the beginning of love for others is learning to listen to them. What does God value? He values level or knowledge. But we move then from what God values to who God is. 
And in this little section, verses 4 to 6, what Paul does is he follows them in their argument and he actually agrees with them. Because their argument, as I already kind of said briefly, was, hey, if there's only one God, then that means there's no, quote unquote, there's no spiritual reality, so to speak, behind an idol. It's not like there's Yahweh and then there's 17 or 27 other gods. He's saying really there is only one God. Look at verse 4. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know, and he quotes them again, an idol has no real existence. He's like, okay, yeah, I'm good with you there. I agree with that. And that there is no God but one. And then what he does, what Paul does, is he waxes poetical for a moment on the character of God. And the reason why he does this is because if anything is going to break your idolatry in the world and my idolatry in the world, it's having the right understanding of who God is. Think of, we don't really have idols today, so to speak, except that we do have many, many idols. Think of an idol as the inversion of worship. Taking God who is the supreme one, God who is the singular one, God who is the sovereign one, and making him just a little bit lower than other things and making everything else a little higher. That's what idolatry is. It's taking who God is and saying, yes, but you're fourth on the priority list, fifth on the priority list, sixth on the priority list. And Paul's agreeing with the Corinthians saying, no, 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 he's number one. Look at what the text says, verse five says, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, that is, there's, there are, in, in a polyistic, polyistic culture, of course, there's many, many gods. But he's saying the spiritual reality behind them, they're saying that the spiritual reality is less. He says, yet for us there's one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things are and through whom we exist. In other words, what Paul does there is he just, he just pauses for a moment. And he starts to meditate on who God is in his character. And what he says is, look, look at that little phrase there. There's one God the Father that is somebody who's relational, who's personal, who wants to know you. And then it says, and from whom are all things... That is like he made everything. But then he says, and for whom we exist. In other words, what Paul is doing is saying that all of us have this one purpose. He's created us. We have not, not one singular purpose, but one overarching purpose, which is to turn away from the, our own sinful brokenness, surrender to him and say, you're my God. You're my father. I want to follow you. And that's what Paul is saying. You can think of it this way. Augustine has said that one of our biggest problems as human beings is what you might call disordered loves. That something's broken with our heart that we, sometimes we love the wrong things and sometimes we love things too much. We overlove things. It's the word epithumia. We're like too passionate about trivial things. And our hearts get so locked into those things. Disordered loves. We love this thing more than the God who made us. And James K. Smith puts it this way, that you are what you love. So an idol, what Paul is doing here is saying, in in one sense, he's showing that idolatry is disordered loves. All right? See, an idol can have spiritual power even if an idol doesn't exist spiritually. Because the power of idolatry is the power of inverted worship. And the antidote to inverted worship is knowing who God really is. Worshiping him as the one true God. If you've ever traveled outside the United States, say to Haiti, you may have heard some voodoo drums in the middle of the night or to Cuba, discovered Santeria. Sacrifices being offered to saints but really to demons. There is a spiritual 
power out there. There are other quote unquote gods in the universe, but Paul is saying that God, the God of Christianity, the God of creation is a singular God who exists in three persons, who lives in this kind of community and calls us to live into that community. And if God is supreme, then greed or the idolatry of money is wrong. And sexual immorality, the idolatry of sex, or reviling the idolatry of narcissism, the idolatry of putting other people down, the idolatry of breaking down the human, the human persona of other people. Drunkenness is the idolatry of alcohol. And what Paul is saying is here, is if there's one true God, none of those things really have sway on us, or they do have sway on us. They do, but they need to be cut by the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in one sense, the Corinthians were like a lot of modern Christians who were correct in their theology. There's only one God, but actually were falling short in the area of love. Good theology, but bad practice. What well, God values is not so much knowledge, but, but love. And then there really is only one true God, is what Paul says. And then he takes all that and says, so what does that mean? So what? Verses 7 through 14, the third section in the text, which is, uh, is actually somewhat a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to wade into it this way. If you take a look at verse 9, there's a word in verse 9, which is, says, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And what was happening is the Corinthians were saying, hey, we've got all this, we've got this knowledge that there's really only one true God and there's, idols don't really exist, so we do whatever we want. And they were using their knowledge to prioritize their rights, elevating their rights. And he's saying, actually love sometimes restricts your rights because of the other person. I'm going to focus on that word stumbling block there for, for a moment um, and just kind of explain what that idea means. I'm going to give you two scenarios real quick. I want, I want this image to be very clear in your mind. So um, is there anybody here from the Netherlands today? There are some people. Uh, there's a Dutch woman named Safan Hassan of the Netherlands who was a runner in Beijing. This is, this is uh, scenario number one. And uh, she went to Be Beijing to last summer in August to try to win three gold medals. She actually ended up, I think she had two gold medals and one bronze me medal. But in, in one of her semifinal heats in the 1500 race, she was one of these runners that has tremendous, like, uh, physical capacity, so she's running towards the back, and the, the commenters are like, watch her, she's storing her energy, she's going to be ready to go on the last lap, and sure enough, that's what she was doing, except on the last lap, the person right in front of her stumbled, and so she stumbled over that person and went down, and the commenter's like, oh no, it's over. She bounces back up. And now she's like way behind everybody else. I don't know, like seven or nine other runners. And she just starts striding out. And you can see her legs go and you're like, oh my gosh, she just passed two people. Oh my goodness, she just passed three people. She keeps striding out, second place, third place, second place, and then she wins. So that person was a kind of stumbling block. That is the imagery, okay? Or to be a little more down to earth, you know, if you're, if you're running down the bike path or you're riding a bike down the bike path and you, you hit a little stone, that's a, a stumbling stone is the imagery here, okay? I had a, we had a family friend who was biking on the bike path and we actually don't really know what happened, but he hit something and then he, he hit a wall with his forehead. And uh, he had major head trauma and brain trauma. He lost the ability to speak. He lost the ability to walk. And then over a period of about five years, I can't remember exactly how long, but he started learning 
basically teaching himself to speak. Other people start teaching himself to speak. I'm bringing those two images there because one finished the race. Both of them have like a stumbling block in it, but one finished the race and the other one was totally crushed. And what Paul is talking about in this passage is he says, uh, he, he speaks of us destroying the life of another Christian. So it's not like a little, it's not like a little bump and somebody falls over. He's talking about when our behavior actually destroys someone else. Look at, this is in verse 11. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother or sister for whom Christ died. Um, so he's talking about something that is very serious. And I want you to, to think of the first century church. You had these kind of new Christians. And somebody who was an idolater, who's like, man, I got away from worshiping idols. And then somebody who's like a mentor Christian to them brings them back into the temple and is like, man, this is all good. The idea of being destroyed there is not just that they eat the meat. It's that they get sucked back into the lifestyle they had before and their faith is destroyed. Um, here's maybe two more contemporary examples. Maybe you drink alcohol, are friends with a recovering alcoholic, invite that recovering alcoholic who's a younger Christian than you out to have a drink, and they're like, no, I can't, I can't, this is not good for me, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's like a lifestyle I have to choose, and you're like, this, it's no big deal. It's not gonna hurt. And that person stumbles, but they stumble to the point that they go back to their alcoholism and are bound up in it, and their faith is destroyed. That's, what, that's the kind of tragedy that Paul is speaking of here. Um, or to use another example, I know a lot of you guys like to go out to clubs on Friday nights. So this would be like if, if you said to somebody who used to go to clubs, but it was, a, it was like a problem for them because it ended each night with them picking somebody up, meeting somebody, going back to their apartment, sleeping with them. And that person then has come out of that lifestyle sitting next to you in church on a Sunday, and you're like, hey, do you want to go clubbing tonight? And they're like, no, this is part of my background path. So that's the, the kind of thing Paul is talking about is somebody who was an idolater dragging somebody else back into idolatry. And Paul is like rebuking all of these different very serious sins in the church. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he says... Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, if somebody was a drunkard, don't go out drinking with them. If someone has struggled with adultery, then help, and especially if they have what he calls a weak conscience. A lot of times we think of a weak conscience meaning somebody who's easily offended. Most le my own understanding of this is that somebody with a weak conscience is not somebody who's like, man, all those people are so bad because they had one beer last night but it's more like somebody who is susceptible to going back to their old lifestyle and being destroyed. That's the weak conscience. In other words, you've got every, God has given all of us a conscience or a moral compass inside. Some of you have a super strong compass. It's like, I know what right is, I know what wrong is. Some people have compasses that are sort of medium, and then other people have compasses that are very easily swayed. Their compass is sort of broken. And he's saying, man, if there's somebody around you whose compass is easily moved, then think of that person as being someone that God has given his own son for. And man, don't put a stumbling block in front 
of that person. Let me just make a, a couple application points on, on that point. I want us to be close to what God is doing in the world. So the problem for and some churches is not that they're too close to the world, but too far from the world. In other words, God wants us, I believe, to have a, a congregation that is mixed with weak and strong consciences. Not merely one kind of people. Not people who just know what is right. He wants this church to be filled with people who have no idea where the book of Leviticus is and people who have memorized the book of Leviticus as well. Will Aaron Holtz, I think, is the one. Just kidding. So that, that's on the one side. Let's be close enough to what God is doing in the world that we're close to those who have weak consciences. Yes, let's be close to those who have strong convictions, but also to those who are so new in the faith that they're susceptible. Like, that's the context he's writing to. Let's, let's have that as well. But let's also gear our congregation and lifestyle to be very cautious and loving and caring about a variety of spiritual levels. You could put this third point, you could put this way. The death of Jesus for your brother or sister means that you have to keep them away from faith-destroying idolatry. Jesus died for your brother or sister, so let's, let's not destroy anyone's faith. I'm just going to make a couple final applications, and then I'll close. Christian faith, first thing is Christian faith values knowledge, but love is supreme. And, and I've already said this, but I'll just say it again. I'm so thankful for the, all of the advanced learning that's happening in this room. And, and in part, it's happening because people want to use their training to serve the world more effectively. And may that be true. May, may the increase of our knowledge increase the richness of life and increase the richness of love. Let's, let's build a community that prizes knowledge but also prizes love. Secondly, I just want to ask you to keep in mind the unity and the singularity and the supremacy and the sovereignty of Jesus. Like, there's no one else who's going to save you. All of your other functional saviors, including knowledge, including wealth, come back to rule you with terrifying power. There's only one savior in the world who's a good savior. So remember his singularity and his supremacy. He's not only created you, he's redeemed you. He loves you, has a purpose for you in this world. And if you have come out, out of idolatry or greed or drunkenness or, or adultery or sexual promiscuity, be very careful that you don't lead somebody else back into those things. And find friends that will love you will help you to keep on the path of holiness that the Lord God wants you to have. Back to Sam Cook. You might know, not know much about geography or trigonometry. You might not know much about algebra. You might not know what a slide rule is for. But if we do love each other, what a wonderful world this would be. Let's start a little bit this week. Are you puffed up or are you built up? May you build others up. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you that Jesus came not to uh, be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we pray that we would be a congregation that while we grow in knowledge, that somehow our ego shrinks. While people grow in erudition, may their desire to serve grow even more because Jesus who knew all things knows all things channeled that knowledge into love we pray this in Christ's name amen